Adam Ragusia made a video on what he considers to be the best cooking videos on YouTube. And he shocks us by praising the Knorr stockpot infomercials with British celebrity chef Marco Pierre White. If you want to know what he thinks we can learn from these, you should definitely check out his video, but I want to focus on one specific thing he noticed in regard to Marco Pierre White. The emotion of being over it. He points out White's complete disregard for the public's perception of him. White doesn't even care to offer proper or factually correct explanations while cooking or even provide continuity in his statements. Most people make their shepherd's pie too dry. I like my shepherd's pie quite wet. A lot of people tend to make the mince too wet. A seasoned award-winning chef, a pioneer in the field of cooking and entertainment who has transformed the status of his profession is seen taunting his craft and renouncing his former high-flying aspirations by partnering with Noor and creating uninspired, imprecise home cooking infomercials based around a bouillon pod. Whether you find this kind of self-ironic resignation charming or not, I couldn't help but notice parallels to other famous figures. I managed to make out a recurring pattern of a concept that I like to call Exuberance of the Aging Artist. I call White an artist in this context because the level of his craft on which he operates is nothing short of art. And he represents another aspect of art as well. Mastering the rules before breaking them. This idea has been famously prevalent in the realm of visual arts, but it ties in well with this concept too. The phenomenon of the exuberance of the aging artist is characterized by a sense of aloofness and excess on behalf of an artist past his prime. This applies to people who have experienced great celebrity, especially from a young age and throughout most of their lifetime. I would say that there are two main aspects to this. Firstly, there is a sort of acquired resignation and, as Ragusia describes it, a feeling of being over it. This resignation is the result of being in the game for so long that you just grow tired of it. Secondly, the aging artist often projects a sense of arrogance. However, I'm not talking about arrogance towards the world or other people, but arrogance towards their former self. This is an important point because only someone who has been around for a long time and has been present in the public eye throughout their life usually has the chance to outlive their youthful ambition and transform their persona for the world to see. To demonstrate the concept, we can look at examples of some of the most critically acclaimed historic as well as contemporary artists. To start off, possibly the most important writer in the history of German literature, Johann Wolfgang Goethe, lived to the age of 82, which was considered incredibly old at the time. And he was writing almost right up to his death. Goethe was a well-known writer during his lifetime and by no means lived in a conventional or modest way. He was in possession of several real estate objects, undertook lengthy travels and was known among his friends to indulge in gourmet food and source his wine from the finest vineyards of the region. Undoubtedly, his proclivity for young women contributed to his image of a bon vivant. At age 74, he fell in love with a 19-year-old girl. In his position as a well-respected writer, he didn't care much for the opinion of the public about his proposal to this girl. But his disregard for public opinion extended to his art as well, and his reputation also allowed him to write nearly anything. His works would often be characterized by frivolous occurrences or emotions, and considering that he also wrote poems for the nobility, he surely also imbued his flattery with the sense of hidden mockery. This all goes to show that he probably wasn't so serious about societal norms of the time, which you could interpret as his way of being over it. But in addition to this first aspect of my theory, Goethe also fulfilled the second criterion as he got older. Often cited as the most influential work in German literature, Goethe's Faust was almost 40 years in the making, which makes up the majority of Goethe's adult life. In four stages of creation, he kept modifying and adapting the play to his liking until its final release in 1808. But within the last six years of his life, he decided to write the much lesser known second part to his drama play. What started out in part one as a symbolic search for the meaning of life by the protagonist Dr. Faust was expanded in the second part to a parable of humanity as it is frequently called, a monumental piece of work aiming to depict the world and the creation of life in its countless meandering storylines. By transcending the study of the individual and focusing on issues of global scale, Goethe claims the big questions of the world instead of merely the individual's meaning of life. He essentially points a finger at his younger self, saying, 
I am better than you. I have understood the world while you struggled most of your life to give one person meaning. That is not to diminish the insight gained from Faust Part 1, but especially the discrepancy between the periods of creation of the two parts and the range of subjects treated in the texts demonstrate the aging Goethe's increased self-confidence and arrogance to elevate himself to the rank of a philosopher of humanity. It is these two traits that classify him as an example of the exuberance of the aging artist. The German heavy metal band Rammstein is known all over the world and has been globally celebrated for decades. An integral part of their image is their lead singer, lyricist and poet Till Lindemann. His lyrics and poems are known for their graphic, sexual and violent language and range of subjects. The brutal songs along with the eccentric and impressive stage shows have garnered the band a worldwide following. After a long hiatus, Lindemann returned with two new albums and a new poetry collection. However, his latest lyrics and poems are noticeably more tame and less graphic than his previous work. Simply shouting profanities has lost its potency. Violence and sexuality are more often implied than bluntly stated, a strong contrast to the younger Till Lindemann who took pleasure in shocking his audience with his unapologetically graphic writing. It almost appears as though he grew tired of this approach, like he is over it. In a context where everything is excessively brutal, nothing is brutal anymore. It is lacking nuance. The aging artist rejects the naively eccentric style of his younger self. What is curious, however, is that with this more subdued writing style came a more graphic visual aesthetic. Rammstein's videos and shows have always been sexually suggestive, but at 57 years old, Till Lindemann decided to do away with the suggestiveness and cut straight to the chase with his side project Lindemann. The latest music videos of the band have been flat out pornographic, with Lindemann himself performing real sexual acts in front of the camera. After being the center of controversy for decades, he toned down his writing but in turn became the very manifestation of his frequently serenaded sexual violence. Insinuation and innuendo have become too weak and essentially a playful gimmick of his youth that had become incapable of shocking anyone any longer. Alternatively, this change could also denote a fear of getting old and wanting to show the world that he has still got it in him. Another German artist was Johann Sebastian Bach, today considered as one of the most important composers of classical music, if not the most important. In contrast to many other classical composers, Bach has been respected and widely recognized as a musician during his lifetime, though mostly as a virtuoso for his talents on the keys. He was a sought-after cantor and concert musician and his prolific production of cantatas earned him a lot of recognition too as he wrote roughly one per week. Being 65 at the time of his death he was considered old for the time period and it is not surprising that his immense success may have contributed to his self-assurance. Bach worked in many different places including a tenure as a cantor at the school of Thomas Kirche during a later phase in his life. Bach was completely preoccupied with music, but he held other non-musical obligations at Thomas Kirche as well. Out of resentment, he would often neglect these duties and engage in other music-related activities. When additionally, Johann August Ernesti, who had little regard for Bach's work, was appointed the new dean of the school, a dispute ensued. Bach was an obstinate believer in his own ways and his arrogance and disregard for the conventions of the time make him an exuberant aging artist. Despite attempts to glorify him as some saintly figure, he was also known as a hedonist as can be deduced from the sumptuous dinner menu of a celebratory feast he attended where quote, a lavish quantity of wine and beer was set before them and apparently communal inebriation was even his goal of the evening. Apart from rumors that Bach was often paid in beer, he had a well-documented addiction to coffee even composing a piece of music in honor of the beverage. Bach was an incredible virtuoso and excellent at improvising as well, therefore one might assume that some of his works were simply exercises in improvisation for him, given the sheer amount of compositions he has to show for his creative efforts. Thus the lengths of overinterpretation that musical scholars are willing to go to regarding Bach's work appear almost ridiculous. This way Bach even posthumously mocks those who attempt to make out patterns of symmetry or number symbolism in a piece that was maybe just an improvisation exercise for the composer. In any case, the prolific Bach and his groundbreaking compositions remain examples of immense creative power and artistic exuberance. 
But other groups of artists aren't exempt from this phenomenon either. We are all familiar with the lavish lifestyles of famous actors, however most of them seem more concerned with upholding a squeaky clean image instead of openly showing that they're over it. An exception to this is the French actor Gérard Depardieu. From his humble beginnings as a son of illiterate parents and a series of unsuccessful education attempts, he managed to establish himself as one of the most beloved actors in France and one of the very few internationally successful French actors. He was honored with many awards and has become a household name in the realm of cinema. His continuous debaucheries, however, have earned him a bad reputation throughout the years, culminating in his relocation to Russia for tax-related reasons. Considering his tumultuous youth and traumatic childhood, his more recent excesses aren't all that surprising. Especially his relationship with alcohol has gotten him into trouble at numerous occasions. According to Depardieu himself, he can consume up to 14 bottles of wine a day, paired with an assortment of different spirits and liqueurs. He has been involved in over 18 traffic accidents, many of them under the influence of alcohol. He has stopped caring about the consequences of his actions and his public image. This resulted in the French actor publicly urinating on an airplane and insulting the staff while visibly inebriated. Depardieu claims that he feels like a resurrected person after receiving a liver transplant and hence enjoys his newly granted life to the fullest. He owns multiple vineyards and restaurants and his constant indulgence is reflected in his physique. It brings to mind Adam Ragusea's assessment of Marco Pierre White's appearance. Not so much fat as swollen with pleasure. The exuberance of the aging artist often expresses itself in the indulgence in culinary hedonism, alcohol consumption or sexual frivolity. This has to do with the growing apathy of the aging celebrity towards his public image and the general disillusionment with societal norms especially after leading a life mostly governed by the pressure of conformity and public scrutiny, it is understandable that this kind of emotion would set in as one's age progresses. But in addition to being over it, we can also usually observe a second effect of this phenomenon which announces itself through the emergence of an attitude of arrogance. As mentioned before, this involves the rejection of former ideals and elevation above the younger self, but also occasionally one's entire professional field or the world. Manifestations of this include Goethe's Faust Part II, Bach's absence from his obligations or Depardieu's tax evasion. We can also look to musical legend Bob Dylan who famously caused general confusion upon being announced as the 2016 Nobel Prize winner of literature and the first musician ever to receive this honor. Dylan failed to react to the news at all for several weeks and did not attend the official ceremony. After letting the jury wait for months, he finally picked up his award in a private meeting because he was conveniently on tour in Sweden. Only shortly before the deadline for his speech, he sent the jury his contribution which showed signs of heavy plagiarism and was hence criticized by many as unworthy of a Nobel laureate of literature, which raises the question whether this was a deliberate mockery on Dylan's part. As you can see, we can find many cases of the exuberance of the aging artist throughout the world and history. And while you might find this display of resignation and arrogance pitiful or even irritating, I think it contains artistic merit nonetheless. It reminds me of a concept of the Romantic period. Friedrich Schlegel first developed the idea of Romantic irony. It is defined as the following a kind of literary self-consciousness in which an author signals his or her freedom from the limits of a given work by puncturing its fictional illusion and exposing its process of composition as a matter of authorial whim. This is often a kind of protective self-mockery involving a playful attitude towards the conventions of the genre. It is a way for the artist to communicate to the reader that only he himself ultimately holds the power to destroy what he has created and to invert the beautiful images he has constructed for the pleasure of the reader. I think this theory can be applied to our exuberant aging artists as well. By subverting what they have built up over the years, they put critics and admirers alike into place in a metaphorical display of power, as if to say, look at what I have created, now see my capacity to destroy it too. This applies to Till Lindemann releasing the sexual tension he built up over the years, Gérard Depardieu betraying his role as a favorite actor in family films by public drunk urination, or Marco Pierre White denouncing his Michelin star-studded former self by smearing a steak with a bouillon pod. 
They all show us that they are in charge of what they have created and how they can change your perception. It instills a different kind of appreciation not for the work of art itself, but for its creator for we realize that without him it would not exist. And even if the thing in question, be it music, writing or even a dish, has developed a life of its own, it is a subtle reminder of the person behind it. But this actually raises an important question. Who does art belong to, the public or the artist? Isn't the artist inseparable from his art and we are hence all subject to his creative whims? Maybe what we find so revolting about the eccentric subversion of an aging celebrity's legacy comes from a very relatable place, namely the fear that what has worked out for so long might just become obsolete at some point, and with it, the artist that is inextricably linked to it, like we can see in the example of J.K. Rowling who keeps desperately adding new revelations on Twitter about the characters of her best-selling Harry Potter book series. As mentioned before, the self-mockery of romantic irony is a sort of protective measure for the artist. So if we can understand the reasons for the exuberance of the aging artist and take it with a grain of salt, maybe it won't seem all that outrageous to us anymore.